but you know, from the start, I have to warn you, I, um, have, I'm, I'm not a specialist in regulation, deregulation, overregulation, but I, what I will try to do, uh, I'll try to put it in a slightly different perspective and to look at uh, the issue of regulation in terms of uh, uh, political will in democracy and in the, in, in, in the background of the global um, environment that we find ourselves in at the moment, uh, 20 years on, after, you know, you, if you look back to, uh, at this, uh, what Europe, what the world, what the democratic world was thinking um, 20 years ago, well, that was the kind of the uh, time of the post-Fukuyama sort of uh, um, Ecstasy, if I might say so. You know, everyone was was happy at the at the very imminent end of of history. You know, so, uh, soon all the world will be liberal democracy, and we'll have no need for uh, defense uh, and, and or you know, sort of even statehood was being questioned and all that. Um, you know, 20 years on, uh, I think uh, the illusions have uh, dissipated, but uh, the um, Fukuyama-induced uh, self-delusion uh, um, of the West, of the democratic West, is still with us, lingering. We are still not past it. Um, so I would like to look at the, at the uh, issue of regulation in, from that perspective. Um, we are in a global competition. That's, that's a nostrum which is uh, repeated uh, very often. But more importantly, uh, we are engaged in a zero-sum game, again. you know. Um, Ten years ago, even seven years ago, uh, the, the reigning doctrine was that actually no, this is not as, you know the, the competition is not a, a zero-sum game. It's a mutually conducive, mutually enriching process in which uh, sort of we gain as much you know sort of as, as we compete and, and uh, so on and so on and so forth. Um, I don't need to point out uh, uh, that that uh, we're currently engaged in a, in a very sort of you know sharp uh, zero-sum game in, in eastern Ukraine. But uh, even if we look at the players further afield, as long as uh, one of the players in the competition treats the whole process and uses it as a zero-sum game, uh, the, the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, the logic of the whole process turns into, um, into, into competition for uh, the most limited bottleneck resources, whether they be uh, technological advances, intellect, or, or material resources. So uh, we, you know, and sometimes we fail to realize that the competition is much sharper than we think. We, we tend to assume that uh, this is something uh, we can, um, you know, get away with just doing a little bit of work, just, just uh, sort of, you know, putting in an hour uh, here or there, and, uh, um, but, but no, actually, uh, it's, it's, it's much tougher than, than we tend to assume sometimes. Um, right. So um, what are the players that, we're engaged in the, that the democratic world is engaged in the global competition with? Well, these are, uh, I would like to uh, call them, the, uh, and the primary, sorry, I have a bit of difficulty with, with my computer who decided to conk out at the moment. Um, I would like to use the term used by Professor uh, John Keane, uh, that the regimes we are uh, currently most sharply competing with are the new despotisms. And uh, he described this in, 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 in a lecture uh, further published in Sydney Democracy Network. Um, as opposed to standard authoritarian regimes, uh, the new despotisms are characterized um, by the fact that they assume at least a certain consensus from their population. Now, what are the new despotisms? Well, these are regimes uh, from Russia to Qatar and from Belarus to Azerbaijan and from uh, People's Republic of China uh, to Kazakhstan. Um, they, and their feature, I think, which is relevant in our discussion, is that unlike uh, the previous totalitarian regimes, and unlike uh, um, the classic authoritarian regimes, they have a subtle combination of uh, um, central government's will combined with deregulation in economic areas. Of course, the China's miracle is, is the most uh, uh, documented. Uh, the uh, economic potential released by deregulation is used to bolster the uh, 
capacities of the state to act centrally uh, and strategically in, in, the, in the global policy, in the global politics, and uh, to acquire new markets and acquire uh, you know, new levers of, of uh, influence. Um, so uh, new despotism are characterized by the combination of economic freedom, but overall, uh, uh, overall control of the uh, economic control of the, of the state by the ruling regime. So the result is a sort of economically active state, which uh, uh, manages both to use and exploit the advantages uh, of comp competitiveness uh, and growth brought by the free market elements, as well as using the economy as a tool for political and geopolitical goals. And we see that in, in the People's Republic of China, we see that in Russia, uh, and as well as in, in, in uh, places like Azerbaijan, which is a classic sort of uh, new despotism. Right, now, why is that, uh, why is that relevant? Um, I, I'm using this because this is an alternative model which is being developed. While we think in, of those regimes in terms of these are well the backwards, slightly authoritarian uh, states which inevitably will become democratic in due course, uh, they do not view themselves as, as such. Uh, they develop a model of uh, governance, of uh, managing economy, of political control, of media policy, uh, even uh, historical memory policy, which uh, sets itself as an alternative to the uh, democratic West. Um, it's surprising, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, Chinese newspapers in Hong Kong uh, sort of hotel, how much of the space is devoted to kind of discussion with, with the democratic West, pointing out its inadequacies, pointing out its uh, um, flaws and inner contradictions and so on and so forth. What it reminds me of is, uh, of course, I grew up in the old uh, Soviet Union and uh, the amount of space which was devoted to arguing with the democratic capitalist West in those days. Um, the difference is that at that time, uh, there was an equal uh, amount of energy and space devoted in the West to argue why the Western model, why the model of democratic capitalism is superior to the totalitarian alternatives such as Chinese or the uh, Soviet communist one. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we had a discourse which justified why Western capitalism, uh, through its uh, model of uh, economic freedom, of social freedom, of free speech, uh, and uh, democratic elections is superior and why it is ultimately going to uh, trump over, over the sort of totalitarian alternatives. Um, so uh, we had a sort of Washington consensus, well, Washington consensus uh, was the result, the result of this decade-long debate in the Western society why our model of managing things, uh, well, using deregulation, this is the great sort of uh, advance of the 80s and, and the uh, accepted opinion of the 80s that deregulation works better than, than state regulation. Uh, why is that uh, going to help us to win over totalitarian alternatives? The difference with the present day is that while there is, uh, in the new despotism, whether it's Russia, whether it's Belarus, and I've read quite a few sources in Belarus how they're arguing about the contradictions of Western society, whether it's China, uh, they're arguing why uh, Western democratic states do not work, why they are sort of uh, uh, shaken by crisis, why they are always uh, hit by new uh, economic misadventures from states like uh, uh, Greece and, and so on and so forth, uh, why uh, there is a discontent and resentment uh, uh, brewing up in those societies, why there is a moral, uh, uh, moral degeneration as uh, you know, uh, you probably all know about sort of this narrative by, uh, promulgated by Kremlin. Um, so there's ongoing debate why uh, the new despotism, this new model is superior, why it is an answer to the problems uh, posed by democracies. Whereas uh, uh, unlike 20 years ago, unlike uh, 25 or 30 years ago, there is no correspondent discourse in the West uh, trying to prove that our model, despite its inadequacies, is superior to what is being offered. We still view those, our global competitors of ours, as, as the kind of historic mistake, uh, which w historic inevitability and progress will um, smooth out and like a wrinkle in the fabric. The, it, and it's, um, you know, they, they will end up being democracy. But they don't view themselves as this. They view themselves as the next stage in the development. And they uh, work very hard at producing a discourse, an ideological discourse, which justifies why their model of uh, deregulation on, on the lower level with ultimate regulation. Of course, the regulation is fictitious. Uh, all the economic freedom is only 
are there, and social freedom and freedom uh, and, and free media is only there as, as much as it is granted by the ultimate control of the state regime, whether it's Putin's regime or Lukashenko's regime or the Beijing uh, uh, sort of uh, central committee. Uh, but um, it, it is fictitious, but it's been used uh, as a sort of as a, a new step, as a new model to uh, show that actually we have the answer to the West's ailments. Now, that brings me back uh, to, to our own problems. Uh, yesterday we spoke a lot about the problems in, in uh, uh, depoliticized democracy, uh, to, uh, to use uh, Peter Uchen's term, or procedural democracy, as Pierre Manot puts it, where uh, infinite uh, complications of regulation uh, need to uh, pass through very, approval of various quangos, uh, committees, and, and uh, uh, such other unelected bodies, uh, complicates uh, the decision-making process to such an extent that uh, uh, expression of political will becomes extremely problematic. Uh, to use the example used by uh, uh, Lisa Pakosta yesterday, uh, previously, if a rabid dog marched into a village, uh, just somebody took a, a rifle and shot uh, that dog. Uh, now you have to get a permission of the committee, uh, proper people to do that, and to raise the question whether perhaps th this dog should be treated in an asylum before and, and entered into a dialogue with before it can be put down or at, at all. So uh, this, this, I think, this example nicely illustrates uh, the, the complications which are brought. Um, and uh, we live as though, uh, you know, we, we admit those complications uh, produced by overregulation as though um, a European Union model and the Western democratic model in general was the only answer to, to, the, sort of, to the historical process. But what I was trying to illustrate that actually quite a lot, more than half of the world, and probably population-wise, a uh, bigger uh, part of the world's population live in the regime, and they approve of the regimes which uh, present themselves as, uh, as the next stage to democracy's problem, which treat themselves as, as superior, in a sense, more advanced, which can use all the uh, innovations and inventions uh, produced by the West, but, you know, uh, like media control, but they use it in order to suppress the freedom and suppress the, the values which emanate from the same West. And, and this is asymmetrical attitude. And uh, we cannot any longer uh, be so relaxed and um, uh, sort of, in a sense, allow the, ourselves to be attacked by, by the rabid dogs of the new despotisms, whether it's uh, uh, because... Uh, uh, well, every time sort of uh, there is a new uh, outrage in, in, in East Ukraine, it's uh, it's a uh, and, and the West fails to respond. It's a proof to these uh, regimes that yes, Western uh, free world is unable uh, is unable to uh, react in a proper way and is unable to uh, defend its own values and its own sphere of influence. It's losing in the zero sum game, um, and this is a potent argument to, to our opponents that they are on the right track and we are on the wrong track. And of course, um, if you look at um, the kind of uh, what is happening in the, uh, in the in the European Union now, if you look at the cases uh, like Greece and uh, um, and uh, especially Greece, of course there is a great temptation to um, mobilize the political will by getting rid of deregulation. But that would be precisely my suggestion: is that would be precisely the wrong conclusion from the premises. Of course, there is, we are tempted to go a similar way by trying to overregulate and, and uh, thus mobilize political will uh, to deal with cases, uh, with incu well, nearly incurable cases of economic decline and uh, spendthrift governments. Uh, I think we have to recover the um, narrative of uh, economic freedom and social freedom and deregulation as uh, the strength, not the weakness of Western society. That's to say, to look for a uh, deregulation regime which allows uh, political will to emerge democratically without this rabid dog dilemma. And I think only then we can formulate a uh, coherent narrative why, after all, despite all the crises and all the weaknesses, uh, Western uh, democratic uh, system is superior and it's going to triumph in the long run over, over the non-democratic uh, alternatives, the new despotisms. Well, that's more or less what I wanted to offer in, in terms of uh, comments, and uh, I hope it's not too much astray. Thank you. Thank you.
Kas selles lääne demokraatias üldse on veel tulevikus ruumi sellisele aatelisele, maailma vaatelisele poliitikale või ongi tulevik selline protseduuriline automatiseeritud demokraatia? Ja, if I understood you rightly, the future of idea-based policy, well, well, that that's what I was leading to. I mean, sort of, we we don't have an a kind of unifying narrative to justify why we, the West, are superior to these uh, other regimes, whether it's Lukashenko's Belarus or Putin's, uh, uh, Putin's Russia or uh, Beijing's, uh, Beijing's uh, um, uh, regime. You know, Washington Consensus was something that was very, you know, 20 years ago was something that, you know, was the book by which we all played, you know, the agreement that uh, uh, capitalism, economic freedom and democracy and prosperity and growth go, go together like, uh, like uh, uh, love and marriage in, in, in the Frank Sinatra song. Well, uh, um, now I think uh, neither the Frank Sinatra's uh, axiom holds true nor, uh, nor the Washington Consensus. But there is Beijing Consensus. But we don't have a renewed uh, consensus about what uh, set of ideas actually guarantees uh, not only a sort of uh, a free society but also growth, prosperity, uh, stability and strength to resist. And I, uh, this is what I was working to. You know, we have to bring in this, this new narrative, and of course, uh, this will mean uh, the repoliticization of democracy, of which Peter Ushin was speaking yesterday. Uh, yes, we have to have the ideas, you know, that, that uh, give direction to what we are doing, not just a sort of kind of argument about uh, shapes of banana. Um, I'm not going to ask, I'm just going to make a statement. I'm reading some very interesting books lately, one after the other, and wishing other people would read books as well, and especially government leaders and so-called leaders. But uh, one of them is written by an American conservative who is saying very much what you are saying, that we've lost the narrative, and that um, we're allowing us by the politically correct police uh, to slowly, slowly acquiesce to losing our freedoms. That we be become so super sensitive to words and what they might mean and where it may categorize us that we become afraid to say anything and we allow the left, the radical left particularly, to demonize us, to put us into boxes and to shut off the debate by saying, ah, you're a racist, ah, you're bigoted, and allowing it to go no further where we cannot even talk about the issues because we've been labeling and pushing people into boxes. So in addition to the new despotism, which I think is an excellent way of explaining it, we have the domestic left-wing extremists who seem to be bent on also undermining the whole narrative that we should be agreeing on. So, thank you. Thank you. What's the name of the conservative that, that wrote the book? Oh, this, this man it might be a surprise to you. He's a neurosurgeon. His name is Ben Carson. But he's one of many that I've been reading, and it just was the latest one I had on hand. And uh, he, he's quite worried about the future of America, bringing out all of these, uh, these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I couldn't agree more, as we all should be worried about the future of America, because that, if that goes, then, you know, sort of what hope there is for us. Um, but um, I think what, what you described in terms of uh, uh, what you described as political correctness is, is just over-regulation in the area of free speech. And yes, this is, uh, this is a way in which uh, uh, a sort of despotism creeps in, into the heart of the free society under the very sort of kind of humanitarian pretense. And I think the task for the conservatives is to uh, revert back to what we were originally. You know, when conservatism arose as a sort of self-conscious political movement, Edmund Burke and all that, this was a defense of the principles of free society against uh, liberals who then were guillotining people in France. And how it all started with, with sort of, you know, kind of innocuous things like return to nature and, you know, sort of, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, revolt against authority, the, the staple of the today's uh, everyday liberal discourse. So, yes, we have to defend liberty from liberalism nowadays. Okay. Thank you.